So, hello. Hello. Uh, welcome to the Right Hour podcast. I'm Marie Dreisey. And I'm Farouk Sultani. And that is the case. Yes. Right Hour podcast, the podcast scratch night or scratch podcast night. I don't know. Pod scratch. Pod scratch. Welcome to the pod scratch. <laughs> That sounds, sounds like, like a bad a, club. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, what do we wouldn't be allowed in? That sounds like something that Stefan would talk about. <laughs> yeah, uh, welcome to our third official episode and fourth technical episode. Um, if you don't know what this podcast is about, I mean, we've just told you what it's about, but uh, stop now, go back, listen to the last three and a half episodes. They will tell you what they are, and it's quite nice as well. Yep. And it's, a, it's something to do, isn't it? Yeah. Um, today, as always, we've got some pieces of drama for you. Um, if you recall, last time some meant four. Yes. And this yep. time some means three. So some is one of those words that changes its um, meaning depending on context. Yes, it does. Yeah, it does. A little variety. It's a spice yeah. of life. Yeah, I mean, isn't that every word? But it is. I've given a lecture on this. Um, yeah, he has. I slipped through it. <laughs> <laughs> so for a bit of context, I was apparently her teacher. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, technically. Technically. Yeah. Before we start, uh, remember, um, the internet is a majestic place. And one of the things that you can do in it is to um, share this podcast and to share this podcast with other people and to subscribe to this podcast on various forms of media yep. and to review it. Did you know you can review it? Yes. You can review it. You can give it stars or you can write it as a review. Yep. You, you can, can tell us how much you love it on multiple platforms. You can do that on Facebook. You can do it on Twitter. You can do it on SoundCloud, iTunes, Spotify. Make make multiple accounts yep. and rate us. Yeah. Um, cheat the system. Yep. It needs to be somebody other than just my mom. Unless you don't like us, in which case none of those things apply. Yeah, please don't. We're, don't we're, tell we're us fragile. We're terrible. Yeah, we're, we're, we're very fragile. Yeah. So, what is our first piece, Marie? Our first piece tonight is called Be Bold, Be Bold. This is? I thought it was called Be Bold, Be Bold, Be Bold, Be Bold, Be Bold, Be Bold. I think it's just one Be Bold, or two Be Bolds. Two Be Bolds. So our first piece tonight is Be Bold, Be Bold by Donna Latham. Grandmama, I grow weary of tedious embroidery finger play. I yearn to dash through the meadows, and yet I languish once more trapped indoors like a greenhouse rose. April showers bring forth May flowers, sweet Olivia. We are obliged to endure the storms before we welcome the blossoms. Do tell me a story. It will pass the time until the storm abates. Please, not a child's fairy tale, but a true tale. I am 16 now after all, and no longer suited for children's fare. Very well, Olivia. Come close. Lady Mary was young. Lady Mary was fair. She claimed as many suitors as you have fingers on your hand. Pray, accept this trinket from my recent journey to Italy. For its compliments, your emerald eyes, kind Lady Mary. For for you, Lady Mary, a, a rose kissed by the dew. As I shall one day kiss your dewy lips. Yet Lady Lady Mary Mary cared not not a whit for any of them, save for Mr. Fox. Mr. Fox cut a dashing figure. Tall and handsome was he, with golden hair that cascaded in gentle waves to his shoulder. About him, Mr. Fox carried an aura of mystery. Ah, there was much Lady Mary did not know of Mr. Fox. And she was intrigued. Tirelessly, Mr. Fox wooed Lady Mary. Following a brief courtship, Lady Mary promised her hand to dashing Mr. Fox. One mild evening, Mr. Fox bade farewell to Lady Mary at the home she shared with her father and her three fine brothers. 
Your loveliness so bewitched me that I nearly forgot to inform you. I have been summoned away on urgent business and must be gone a fortnight. Nevertheless, upon my return, we shall seal our wedding contract. And thus he took his leave. In his absence, Lady Mary, for, for the, the very, very first, first time, time, grew distressed by all she did not know of Mr. Fox. Mr. Fox was frequently summoned away on pressing matters. Yet he never shared with Lady Mary where he journeyed. Aye, this unidentified business itself was most vexing. For Lady Mary knew not how Mr. Fox acquired his wealth. His home proved most disquieting of all. You see, Olivia, Mr. Fox boasted of a magnificent manor far, far at the outskirts of the village. Hitherto, he had never invited Lady Mary and her father to visit him there. A manor in which she would presently reside. Indeed, Indeed though, though Lady, Lady Mary had, had enjoyed nary a glimpse. At last, the morning before her lover's homecoming, Lady, Lady Mary awoke, awoke with a sense, sense of resolve and a spirit, spirit of adventure. What a lovely day for a lark. Today I shall make my way through the forest to Mr. Fox's manor and visit it for myself. Thus, Lady Mary set forth on her journey. Lady Mary walked a long, long way, well beyond the meadows and through the dense woods. At length she came upon Mr. Fox's home. It was precisely as he had described it. Hidden in the deepest forest, and completely surrounded by a soaring stone wall. Lady Mary sought the wall's entry, and when she found it, she spied an inscription above it. Be bold, be bold, read she. I am bold, laughed Lady Mary, and she entered the gate. She strode through Mr. Fox's lush gardens, pausing to pluck a stalk of fragrant lavender. Merrily, she stepped to his door and spied a second carving above it. Be bold, be bold, but not too bold. Oh, one can never be too bold. Lady Mary fairly danced through Mr. Fox's entryway. What she beheld took her breath away. Luxurious tapestries bedecked the walls. A splendid stairway sprawled before her. A golden urn, large enough, truly large enough, for Lady Mary to stand inside, stood sentry at the doorway. Aye, Lady Mary's inquisitive eyes devoured the opulence. She skipped up the stairway, seeking the chamber at its very summit. When she came to the chamber door, she spied... A final inscription? Be bold, be bold, but not too bold, lest that your own heart's blood run cold. Fingertips resting on the door, Lady Mary hesitated for the very first time. Her scalp prickled, her heart flip-flopped inside her breast. Be still, be still, my heart, for I have ventured this far, said she with determination, and she stepped inside the chamber. What she beheld took her breath away. Blood was splattered on the walls, skeletons dangled from the ceiling, and bodies were strewn everywhere. The corpses of young women. On one side of the room, their discarded clothing was tossed in a slapdash mound. In another, their jewels desperately clung together in a tangled heap. Thinking nothing, nothing more, more than, than flight, flight, Lady Mary, Mary whirled, whirled round. round. Dear Lord, I must leave this appalling place. She fairly took wing down the stairs. But whom should she spy coming up the walk? Mr. Mr. Fox, Fox himself. himself. Head held high, Mr. Fox strode, elegant and proud. His golden curls glowed in the warmth of the sun. His fingers, aye, his fingers, were entangled in the dark hair of a woman he dragged behind him. That pitiable soul was clad in wedding garb, which was stained with her own blood. Lady Mary's lover appeared to be whistling. Frantic to depart the manner of death, 
she nearly plunged headlong down the stairs. Wildly, she searched for a hiding place. She leapt behind the urn and held her breath. At that very instant, Mr. Fox opened his door and dragged his squirming prey inside. Lady Mary willed herself to remain silent. Silent. Heart ferociously throbbing, Lady Mary peered around the urn. She spied that poor soul, fallen in a faint and slumped on the floor. Lady Mary discerned upon the lady's finger a dazzling ruby ring. Ha! Mr. Fox spied it as well and desired it for his own. As Lady Mary observed, motionless, Mr. Fox struggled to wrest it from the lady's finger. Alas, Alas, the the jewel jewel was was tightly tightly fixed. fixed. He strained to remove it, but it refused to budge. Displaying nary an instant's hesitation, Mr. Fox withdrew the sword from his sheath, brandished it overhead, and with one swift, tidy motion, mightily hacked off the worrisome finger. Finger and and ring ring took took flight flight and and tumbled tumbled through through the air. Mr. Fox gracefully cast out his hand and caught the ring. And And the the finger, finger, the finger finger fell fell straight straight away into into Lady Mary's lap. lap. Lady Mary stifled her scream and clamped shut her eyes as Mr. Fox's hands fumbled over the floor in quest of the finger. After a moment, he grew impatient and abandoned his search. Merde! He flung the woman over his shoulder and carried her up the stairs. And across his threshold. Lady Mary remained stock still until she heard the chamber door slam. And then... Thinking Thinking nothing nothing more more than flight, she bolted outside, tore through the garden, and dashed a long, long distance through the woods, across the meadows, and home. The next morning, Lady Mary and Mr. Fox were to sign their wedding contract. As was customary in the village, father arranged a lavish wedding breakfast prior to the signing. Good morrow. Good morrow with Mr. Fox. Lady Mary's father and her three three brothers brothers stood far at the end of the the dining hall. Lady Mary entered at the opposite end and drifted slowly toward them. Mr. Fox waited, elegant and proud. He beamed fondly as he observed fair Lady Mary approach. As she drew nearer, Mr. Fox's smile dimmed and he called out in concern. My beloved... You appear as pale as a dove. He clasped Lady Mary's hand and searched her face. Oh, Mr. Fox, I could not sleep last night, for I had the most distressing dreams. I cannot sever them from my mind. Now, now. Scolded Mr. Fox with a waggle of his finger. You are fully aware that dreams run to the contraries, are you not? You must never allow dreams to vex you, my lamb. Yet I do so delight in unlocking their mysteries. Pray, share your dreams with me. I, with all assembled, your agreeable voice will pass the time until breakfast is served and our contract sealed. Very well, Mr. Fox. I dreamed that you were called away on business and that yestermorn I visited your home on a lark. I walked a great distance and at length located your manor. It was as you portrayed it, far, far at the edge of the forest and encircled by a stone wall. Above the wall's entrance, I discovered a message. (laughs) But it is not so, protested he. Ah, Mr. Fox, it was so, in my dream. Pray, Lady Mary, hasten on with your tale. Mr. Fox, you are aware that I am bold. In my dream... I entered straight away. I visited your lush garden with its sweet lavender and found my way to the manor's entry. Over it, I spied a second inscription. Be bold, be bold, but not too bold. Mr. Fox's broad grin remained fixed, but his voice contained the slightest quiver. (laughs) But it is not so. Ah, Mr. Fox, it was so in my dream. I slipped into your manor and beheld its golden urn, rich tapestries, beckoning staircase. I confess, I could not resist rushing upwards to a chamber door. Above it, 
yet a final inscription. Be bold, be bold, but not too bold, lest your own heart's blood run cold. By now, Mr Fox's smile had stolen away from his wan face. He hissed. But it is not so, nor twas not so. Looking about restlessly, he demanded... Whenever will this bloody breakfast commence? Mr Fox, it was so. In my dream, and in my dream, I entered that room, a bedchamber, and the scene that poisoned my vision I shall never forget. Blood stained the walls. Corpses were abandoned to rot. The corpses of young women. Their cherished possessions were heaped like leaves for the burning. His face mottled, Mr. Fox burst out. But it is not so, nor twas not so. I insist it was so. In my dream, in my dream, I dashed from that hideous chamber. Its contents blazed into my memory. Its stench scorched forever in my nose. I nearly tumbled down the stairs in my haste. Suddenly, whom do I spy approaching? You, Mr. Fox, in my dream, my dream. You dragged a youthful woman, wealthy, beautiful, and clothed for her wedding. You yanked the terrified creature into your home. But it is not so, nor twas not so. It was so in my dream. Terrified myself, I leapt behind your urn. I peeked out, forcing my very breath to cease. I observed a ruby ring on that innocent lady's finger. Mr. Fox, ah, you spied it as well wrestled with it, but it would not relent. Did you turn away? Oh no, Mr. Fox. It transpired in my dream that you drew your sword and forthwith hacked off the finger. The ring took flight and you managed to secure it, but the finger, the lady's finger. By now, Mr. Fox's eyes were black with fury. Teeth bared, he fairly spat out his words. But it is not so, nor twas not so, and God forbid it shall ever be so. Lady Mary levelly met his gaze. It is so, and it was so. Behold the finger I have to show. Thinking nothing more than flight, Mr. Fox whirled to flee. At that moment, Lady Mary's three brothers marched forward and drew their three swords, stopping him cold. Stopping him cold. At length, Lady Mary's father and her three brothers, with Lady Mary at the forefront, escorted Mr. Fox to the Rose Garden. And what Lady Mary executed there amidst the blossoms, I shall never reveal. Lest that Lest your own, that your heart's, own blood heart's blood run cold. All right, that was Be Bold, Be Bold by Donna Latham, directed by Emma Jude Harris. The role of Grandma was played by Zara Tompkinson. The role of Olivia slash Lady Mary was Pippa Beckwith. The role of Mr. Fox was played by Ross Kernahan. The role of Father, Suitor 3, and Brother 3 was played by Dale Savage. Suitor 1 and Brother 1 were played by William Jarvis. And Suitor 2 and Brother 2 by Matt Penman. I think this is a fun story. I think it's a really um, weird story. But a good weird. Yeah. A sort of creepy, eerie... Um, it reminds me a little bit of sort of Angela Carter style weird things, but I think it's I think it's much more uh, pleasant than the traditional Angela Carter scary thing. Yeah. So, so. some interesting statistics. So Farak got some interesting statistics for us. That's, what that's have you got, Farak? Which is uh, our yeah. podcast has been listened to. Uh, about 700 times, um, that's around 200 people per episode, 230 people per episode, which is really good. Yeah, Because great. that is already... That's more than just my mom. Yes. Um, that means that um, 
we've already had a further outreach than your run of the mill um, scratch night or, yeah. or new writing showcase. Yep. The bigger that we can make that, the better it will be yep. for everyone, for the writers, for the listeners. So please do share our work. It's nice. Yeah, like and share. We, we put a lot of hours into it. The actors put a lot of hours, the director, the writers. Um, you know, it's a passion project for a lot of us. Nobody's getting rich off of it. So if we can... Apart from you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah. I'm rolling in the donuts. Um, yeah, no, no one is getting rich from this. Um, what about the bosses? The man. The man's man, getting rich. The man's getting rich. The man rich. always gets rich. Um, yeah. Tell people about us. Yeah. Please. We're nice. Tell everyone. We're, we're lovely. He, he's so-so. So. Uh, he has his moments. She's obsessed with um, Franz Ferdinand. For the Archduke, not the band. Not that the band's not great. Go band, but you know. Yeah, but the Archduke came first. Yeah, yeah. Fascinating guy. If anybody's interested, tweet me. I'll tell you all about him. She will. I really will. <laughs> <laughs> okay. What do we have next? Next, we had You Had Me at Hello by David Payne. Good evening, my name's Natalie and I'm calling from Injury X and I just wanted to ask if you or someone close to you has had an accident recently or... Hello? Good evening, my name's Natalie and I'm calling from Injury X and... Good evening, my name's Natalie and I'm calling from Injury X. Uh, a colleague of mine has left me your number with a note to say you might be interested in accident insurance. Is that correct? Uh, no, thank you. Because you do know that you or a loved one may be entitled to compensation. Did my colleague explain how the team at Injury X can support you with this? I don't, I can't remember. Would you be happy to give me just 30 seconds to refresh your memory? Not really. If after the 30 seconds you are not interested, then I promise I will leave you to enjoy your evening. You'll be removed from our system and nobody from Injury X will bother you again. Uh, what do you think? Can I can I have just 30 seconds of your time? There is, there's no obligation. Please? Okay. Thank you, Miss... Jane. Thank you, Jane. So, here at Injury X, we aim to offer you the best support in regards to achieving compensation for an illness or accident you have suffered. We work with a team of specialist claim partners and some of the UK's leading injury firms because we believe passionately that you deserve the maximum possible compensation in the shortest time. You are under no obligation and we work on a completely no-win, no-fee basis. Thank you so much for listening. Please also be aware that this conversation may be recorded for training and monitoring purposes. I'd like to start by taking a few short details from you, if that's okay. Can I begin with your full name, please? Uh, hello? Jane? Yes. Are you still with me? Yes. Can I have your full name, please? Smith. Jane Smith. And is that Mrs? Jane? Sorry? Uh, are you married? Uh, I'm not sure. You're not, you're not sure if you're married? My husband's just died, you see. Oh, um... I'm I'm very sorry to hear that, Jane. It's a really difficult time for me right at the moment. Yeah, of course I I totally understand. Sorry, I I shouldn't have even answered the phone. I just I didn't know what else to do. I feel so alone, stupid, really ridiculous. No, no, you're not stupid at all. Is um is there no one you could go to a, a friend's house or? No, I've got to stay here to let them in. Sorry. They said they won't be long. Your your friends won't be long. The ambulance. Ambulance? I rang ages ago. I, I, I don't know where they could have got to. Oh, is the ambulance for you, Jane? There's three-way traffic lights just off the third tree island. I suspect that's probably where the... Jane, are you, are you hurt? Jane, who's the ambulance for? It's for him. 
When did your husband die? It's all my fault. Jane, love, how long has your husband been dead? I'm not sure, about ten minutes, maybe fifteen now. Oh my god. Um. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Um. Shit. Are you? Uh, are you? Uh. Are you, uh, well, are you sure that he's uh, dead? Yes, I'm sure. Have are you? Um. I looked. At, I looked for a pulse. There's nothing. Or breathing or. No, he's gone. What about the 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 chest things? Um. The oh god, I can't even think of the. Uh, shit. Uh, uh, CPR and then breathing into the uh, the mouth the mouth no, to mouth. No, I tried that all that and I tried breathing into his mouth. Nothing. The chest compressions just made it worse. It just it came out more. Came out more. The blood. They said to try and stop it bleeding, but I couldn't find anything to. I just put a wash on. You see, all my bath towels are in, and it's in the middle of a cycle, so I can't open the door now. I've got a tea towel on it. I've got. Two, actually. There's one. The one's got a hole in through. The dog, it, it seems to have nearly stopped now. What happened to him? His eyes are open. Jane? He's looking at me. Oh, my God. Uh, did did he, did he fall or...? He's definitely dead. Did someone do this to him? <laughs> oh, God! Was he attacked? Yes. Who by? <laughs> Is it someone you know or...? Jane, who did this? I did! What? What did what did you do? Uh, I stabbed him. You stabbed him. Yes. Jane, you do realise I'm going to have to call the police. I've already called them. They're on their way. They said I'd done the right thing and not to touch him. I think the bleeding stopped now. Okay. Um... Uh, where, 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 is, where is he now? He's just lying on the floor, on the rug. Where are you? I'm sitting by him. Should I close his eyes, do you think? Do they say, stay sh- shut by themselves? Or uh, I've never done this before. Well, probably best not to touch him if that's what the police said. What about the knife? Why, where is it? I wasn't sure if I should pull it out. Oh, um... Uh... I watched one of those medical shows years ago and this woman... Uh, from that sitcom, my mum used to like it. Not the live of birds, the other one. She had a big piece of glass stuck in her and her husband pulled it out, you know, because he thought to try and help her. But you would, wouldn't you? But it cut her. But it cut all her insides and she bled to death. So I thought it best to leave it in. What What do you reckon? Uh, maybe let the paramedics deal with it when they get to you. I called them at just before 10 2. They're still not. Bad really, isn't it? I suppose that there's little children or something and they're poorly, then... There's no one with you, you said? No. Is is there anyone you can call? No. Your mum or...? There's no one. Look, do you want me to leave you to it? No, no. I'm sorry, I I, I shouldn't have called. I feel awful. This is the last thing you need right now. I'm really sorry. No, please, stop. Please, don't go. I don't want to be on my own. Please, I beg you. Okay, okay. Sorry, what did you say your name was? Uh, Natalie. Hello, Natalie. Hi. <laughs> so what is it you're selling? Oh, God, don't worry about... Uh, no, nothing important. It really doesn't matter anymore. <laughs> Why did you do it, Jane? I don't know. It's an accident. I don't mean to. You have a row, or...? He was angry. With you? Mm. Do, do, do you want to tell me why? You you don't have to. We could, uh, we could talk about something else. No, it's all right. He... He came at me. He came at you? Yes. I'm guessing not for the first time. What? Where are you going to go when when this is all over? Than I expect. Oh, I'm sure that won't happen. I'm not. No, they have things, don't they? They're a, a law. What's it, what's it called? Mitigating circumstances. That's it. You've you've done everything right. You you've owned up. You've been honest. You you've tried to get help. You haven't lied or tried to cover anything up. Mm. They'll, they'll take all of that into account, you know. Well, we'll see, won't we? So, what about you then? <laughs> Me. Tell me about yourself. Oh, I'm sure the last thing you want to hear about is my life. But boring doesn't even begin to cover it. Boring sounds quite refreshing right at this moment. Yeah. Uh, uh, well, not, not much to tell, really. Uh, 
35, dead end job, as you can tell. Night shift? Yeah. Team of you, is there? No, just me tonight. I'm sure that breaks all sorts of loan working rules, not that our boss gives a shit. You're selling accident insurance. That's a bit ironic, isn't it? Hmm. Beyond crap, really. We all have to make ends meet. Sometimes you have to do what's necessary to survive. You don't enjoy it? No, I hate it. I feel like I'm taking advantage and using people. You know when you, you just think there should be more to life? What did you want to do? Um, I wanted to be an actress. Stupid, really. Even when I was really little. Me and my mates used to pretend we were characters from Neighbours. I was always a um, blind giant super brain. Oh, that's what they used to call me at school. She had hidden depths though, didn't she? Yeah. I'd take her glasses off and suddenly Guy Pierce couldn't wait to shag her. Not the best example of feminism, but... No. I don't know. I didn't want to be famous or anything. I'd, I'd hate that. Yes. Anonymity is something to be treasured. It was just... Maybe I just like the thought of being someone else. Even just, just for half an hour or so. Still, I'm halfway there. <laughs> Still get to read from a script. <laughs> yes, I suppose so. I'm sorry, the last thing you want to hear is me moaning. No, honestly, I'm interested. Please, go on. Right, it's just... At the moment, it's all there is, isn't it? In front of me. What to say, how to act, it's all... Mm, I don't know, mapped out. You don't deviate from the script. Oh, first thing we were told in training. I'm guessing there wasn't training for this sort of call. <laughs> yeah. Well, at least you didn't hang up on me. I should be saying the same thing to you. I've deviated you from the script. Yeah, you certainly have. Maybe it's about time someone did. Boyfriend? Oh, don't even go there. It's a bit... Complicated? You could say that. You could say that. I'm not quite on the top of his list of priorities. He's not violent, is he? Oh, no, he's just... He's got a lot of other commitments, shall we say. Uh, Married. Yes, I think I understand. Look, Natalie, I don't know you, and all you know of me is that I've just stabbed my husband to death. So I'm probably the last person you should be taking life lessons from, but honestly, don't be one of those weak-willed women. Don't put up with it, all right? With anything, don't ever make do. Take action. If he's not treating you right, you do something about it before it's too late. Sometimes you have to throw your script in the bin. Or at least change the ending. Yeah. God, where's that bloody ambulance? And the police. They, they, they can't just leave you like this. I'm, I'm going to ring them and tell them to get their asses in gear. This is ridiculous. Uh, what's your address, Jane? 119 Fairbank View. Right, just hold the line a sec. I'm not at home, though. Oh, right. Uh, well, I thought you were still with him. I am. Just not in our house. Okay, okay. Uh, well, where are you? Uh, Jane? It's 29. Yep. St Jude Street. Wimblebury, WB7 8KJ. Are you taking the piss? I'm sorry. You heard. I must say, I love your feature wall. Some people find navy a bit dark and foreboding, but I think it really adds a sense of mystery to a room. Are you, are you, are you in my house? I put a whitewash on for you. Of course, most of it wasn't white. What? You really should invest in some of those little pellets you throw in the machine. We'll combat even the most stubborn of stains. Still, I'm sure by the time you get home, most of the evidence will be washed away. Are you insane? You might need to replace your tea towels as well, but Dunelms normally have a sale on at this time of year. What have you done? Have you or anyone close to you had an accident recently? What the fuck is going on here? Oh, sorry, Natalie. Have I gone off script? What do you think? Should I pull the knife out now? <laughs> Babe, it's me. Where are you? I've just had some mad bitch on the phone who's making out that she's... Hello? How did, how did you get this phone? I'm from Injury X. Would you be happy to give me just 30 seconds to explain Put how... Put Mark on now! I'm afraid Mark can't come to the phone at the moment. But fear not. We have a team of specialist claim partners and some of the UK's leading injury firms. What the fuck are you doing? Best result. Because we believe... <laughs> Sorry. 
passionately believe that Mark deserves the maximum possible compensation for his accident in the shortest time. Oh my, oh my God. <laughs> Please be aware that you are under no obligation. What have you done to him? And we work on a completely no win, no fee basis. No, I've called the police. Already done. I'm sure they won't be long, but I need you to stay on the line, Natalie, while I take up to 30 seconds of your time to explain why I'm doing this. If, at the end of 30 seconds, you're not completely satisfied with my explanation, then I'll finish the call and you'll never hear from me again. What do you think, Natalie? Can you give me 30 seconds? That was You Had Me at Hello by David Payne, directed by Anisha Srinivasan. The character of Jane was played by Jessica O'Toole, and the character of Natalie was played by Hannah Lawrence. Well, there aren't a lot of other people. No, there not No, it's just the two. No. Dun, dun, no. dun. I'd forgotten about that. What do you think of that? You, you, really, you were really excited about that I was that piece really excited. I think it's a really fun creep. I think it has a great twist. Um, and I think it, it, it starts out as a horrifying situation. Like, I can just imagine being a call center worker and just picking up the wrong time and the horror of that and then to have it twist so intensely I think it's a lot of fun uh, what I find really fascinating and it's just it's, so this is the third thing that we had yeah which is either a phone conversation or a conversation about sort of things being recorded is it? um I think this is the second one we second had that one, was a yeah. phone one, yeah. And then we had the one in the recording studio, which is, again, about people's voices coming from far away. Yeah. And knowing the history of radio as I do, that is a very common thing. A lot of radio plays are literally about people talking on the phone. Yeah. I don't know why, but I have the sort of the inkling that that is because we're always curious to hear both sides of a phone conversation. Yeah. And we rarely get to see that. So yeah. on radio, which is, you know, where, where your ear can go anywhere. Yeah. One of the things that should just people naturally want to see or want, well, want to hear is what people are saying on the phone. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, a, it's one of those things where you, um, you don't have a visual clue about whether or not what's being said on the phone is, is truth, is reality, um, and I think that makes it even a little bit creepier, too, in how these things can turn. Because you don't have a visual aid to say, okay, well, you're, you know, you're actually at my house murdering my boyfriend. Like, oh, no, you could just be anywhere. <laughs> that was the... the that was the, the yeah. Um, do we do shout-outs now, or do we wait until... Yeah, we so uh, we're going to take a moment now to shout-out to our Patreons. Uh, yes, hey, we're on Patreon. Uh, yes. Yeah, you can uh, help support us for as little as a dollar a month. Um, every little bit helps. It yes. is all greatly appreciated. 0 0.75 pounds, I think. Yeah, yeah 0 0.75 pounds as of today's current exchange rate. I, see, I just made that up. Yeah, okay. Sort of He's just making up amount. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm actually going to look it up. He's going to look it up. Of course he is. Uh, so yeah, you we've got three tiers. You can be a um, a one dollar yeah. supporter. I was right. <laughs> God, the universe, let him be right. That's the worst. Come well, on, I we should, all just should, secretly wanted him to be wrong, I didn't should, we? I should do this as a job. I should just do predict predict exchange rates. Yes, that's a great career path. Yeah. I can do prediction of exchange rates, but only today's exchange rates, not <laughs> tomorrow's yeah. exchange Useless rates. Useless for tomorrow. <laughs> Be yeah, very short I can career. predict things that people can look up. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so, yeah, so we've got a Patreon. We've got a Patreon, back on topic. Um, okay. So if you do become one of our patrons, you will get a shout out on every episode. So we're going to take a moment right now to do our patron shout out shout out to carol and a shout out to james thank you so much for your support thank you carol thank you james you are really cool so yeah we've already got two patreons do you yeah. want to be the third or the fourth or the fifth yeah six yeah. anywhere up from there you can you, you can be the hundredth if you'd like yeah thank you carol thank you james you are um helping us uh do this yep keep this going 
we appreciate your help and your support. Support. Yes, your help and support. Yes. All right, so the next piece on our list is The Artist Electric by Judas Goff. On Sunday mornings, Daddy and I would sit at the kitchen table and read the theatre reviews from the week before. He would make me toast with butter and I would smell his coffee and I would sit in my nightgown and cross my legs and accent my chin as if I were being photographed for some important magazine. I imagined myself being written about, gossiped about, <laughs> scandals about my lovers. And I told him this and he laughed and smiled. Sometimes there was a quote from him, what he thought about some new writer or director. Everyone loved him. Even those who hated him loved him because they had to listen, had to hear him. What he said mattered. After my mother died, uh, after the accident with the drunk driver, the person who did it never got caught. Every time he walked outside as we tumbled into the narrow cobblestone streets in the West Village near our apartment, behind every wheel of every car was a potential killer. Sometimes he would chase the cars, my my father, just run after them, throw little crumpled pieces of newspaper at them as if he were throwing stones. He would wave his arms, wander delirious through the streets, yelling at cars, is that the one? Is, is, that, is that the one who... But I was with him. I was with him the whole time. And that made him happy. Was he depressed? Of course he was. I mean, everyone knew it but her. They were going to fire him at the theatre. He was done, washed out. His last few seasons, his last few shows, they were disasters. The last show he directed, the one that sent us out to that borrowed house on the beach because he had to get away, it was about a goldfish who learned to talk. This goldfish starts dating a depressed girl with some type of eating disorder living alone in a third floor walk up in Union City, New Jersey. It was supposed to be some kind of quirky comedy. I hate that term, quirky comedy. But it was savage, laughed at. He started taking pills and the pills were slowing him down because because he, um, he, couldn't, he couldn't get hard anymore. Not like when I first met him. Not like when I rejuvenated him after the death of his first wife. No, he slowed down. And he settled into a grim kind of life. And I did too. It was a decline. I never imagined I'd be a widow so young. When I was a little girl, I used to look through the old family albums and see him and mum on vacation in Morocco and China and Australia. I used to be so jealous because I wanted to go, wished that I'd been there. And sometimes I used to wonder, mum, did, did she jump in front of that car on purpose so daddy and I could be alone together without distraction? Sometimes I believe she made that sacrifice for us. Daddy met Liza shortly after Mum died. Liza was a hanger-on at that point. Just followed him around like a lost cat. I mean, who was she? Some social worker who found cheap meds for heroin addicts. She'd never been to the theatre. I spent so many nights with him at dim bars listening to bad poetry and drinking cheap beer, getting a headache from the glow of neon lights burning into the sleazy laundromat across the street. And she... She got all self-righteous at the smell of cigarette smoke and thought beer wasn't ladylike. I can just tell she was a whore in college. At the funeral, all his friends gathered. People who'd known him for years, decades. Maybe they knew him since before I was born. They told stories and it was almost like... It was almost like I wasn't part of his life. He has no other family than her and so I was... It was... They should have been comforting me. Nice enough, that's what I heard. That was the whisper, nice enough, over and over. That's what they said about me. I was nice enough for a second wife, a younger woman, someone to fuck. 
They ignored me and just tripped over her, Brittany, his princess. I was no gold digger. I'll say that a million times or only once. I didn't marry him for his money. He didn't have much money. The house that we stayed at, the house on the beach, the house where he died, it was loaned to him by some actor friend, some actor friend he made famous. He walked around at night in a silk bathrobe and slippers. Certainly he acted like he was entitled to it. He acted like he was entitled to a lot of things. He was a theatre director. He had a certain cachet, a certain profile. And that was sexy. And I loved the way he touched me. When we met, I was living with some other girls in a small rail car apartment and we were all trying to make it. And mostly being ignored and I was a social worker working with at-risk youth and he, he was somebody. I went to graduate school. I had a savings account. I was doing things right. He was somebody. He liked to dress me up, but he had a daughter. Daddy, are you out there? Did you know that she slept in her dead father's theatre the night after he died? She slept in the theatre in brand new silk pyjamas she bought just for that occasion. He liked to dress her up. Short skirts, cute little one-piece cotton dresses in the summer which bounced up around her thighs. Tight black stockings and boots in the fall. Skinny jeans or leggings in the winter. And I would wear what he bought and it was a little show for him. I mean, this is what men do, isn't it? They dress us up. We dress up for them. We wear nighties and short skirts and low-cut shirts and lingerie and we sculpt our faces with makeup and we do our hair just so. And we become a kind of imaginary object. We spend time at the gym, we lift weights and crunch our stomachs. And it's because the human body, on its own, laid bare, it, it's not all that impressive. And what am I to her? What is she to me? Is she my stepmom? Am I her stepmother? Stepmummy Liza. Or maybe just mummy Liza. Maybe just mummy. Or mum. Aren't we, in some way, aren't we still family? When I was a girl, I ran across the stage. He, he sat there watching me. Do this, Brit, do that. Act for me. Yeah, you're better, so much better than those other girls. D those real actors who work for me. <laughs> I could live without them, but not without you. We spent the summer at the house in the beach. I came out to the house at the beach one weekend during the summer. The hottest weekend. It was midsummer, one of the hottest nights of the year, and there were parties and bonfires on the beach. Young people. Young, pretty people, boys and girls, and he liked to be around them, pretended he was still one of them. And she came to stay with us. He was having a party with some actor friends, and some young actors and actresses were sitting in the big living room, drinking wine and gazing out at the ocean. And there was a, a kind of bluish glow out from the moon. And... I wore a black and white bikini bathing suit and high heels. I walked around the house and drank champagne. <laughs> People sat around reading this new play by some hot writer, trying out these different voices and personas. And I sat on this older actor's lap. I didn't know who he was or why he was there or I can't even remember his name, but I... No, I think it was Tommy. And uh, I nibbled on his ear and laughed into him and giggled and scraped the tips of my nails across his chest. And Liza watched me. And so did my father. They both watched me. When the play reading was over, I took my new actor friend by the wrist and pulled him into a bathroom down the hall, not far from the living room. Everyone saw us walk away. That night in the house on the beach, she came, but he hardly noticed her. It was as if he didn't want her to be there. She stayed for the reading, and I guess she was talking to the people there, but... They all noticed me leave. And then she was gone. I don't even remember when she left or who she left with. It was weird. They were jealous. Daddy was jealous of the attention I was getting. And her father, he... He was having a wonderful time just being around the people he loved, people who adored him. It was like all his problems never happened. He needed to be adored. He was drinking and laughing and reading the stage directions for his new play. I know Daddy watched me leave. Saw me leave with that older actor. 
I can just imagine him crushing the ice with his teeth. So angry. So angry at me. It was the first time I'd seen him truly happy. And I honestly think the only thing which put a dampener on it was was that she was there. And we went into the bathroom, me and this older actor, Tommy, I think his name was. And he was just, oh my God, at this point he wanted me so badly. And so I let him have me. I had to. It would have been wrong not to, the way he was begging and pleading and just losing himself. It was sad. Well, kind of. A little pathetic. I let him fuck me right there on the bathroom sink, with me leaning over, looking at myself in the mirror. Watching him through the mirror. At some point the party was over and everybody left and a few people just passed out on the couch and Brittany was... No one knew where she was. And honestly, no one cared. And then we were in the bedroom and his step was lighter and I was getting ready for bed. He grabbed me from behind and he pulled me into bed and he... He touched me. He touched my legs and my thighs and my... And he kissed me and I was... And it was the first time in a long time. I always loved the way he touched me. After sex, the actor, he... um, Tommy, I guess his name was... He just disappeared out the back door of the house. Didn't want to stick around, I guess. I went back to my room and slept a little. Dozed, really. Not restful, not, not deep. I didn't dream. At some point, I had to pee. I walked down the corridor past the bedroom where... I could hear them. I could hear my father and Eliza fucking and moaning. And it sounded like ecstasy. When he was inside me, he said... He said he wanted me. He said he needed me. And I knew in that moment he had forgotten my mother and embraced a new kind of death. A kind of death that's no excuse for living. He said he needed to be with me because he only felt alive when he was with me. I sat by the door. It was was closed, but I could hear it. And I heard. It felt so good. I let him come all over my naked body. And I saw it in my mind. And I laid down on the floor outside the bedroom and curled up like I was a baby. I rocked back and forth and I sucked my thumb and I wanted to pee right there on the floor, but I stopped myself. I wasn't going to be his baby. I stayed by the door and fell asleep and woke up when the earliest rays of sun were creeping along the carpet. The door to the bedroom was open a crack and I pushed my way in. The bed was empty. I saw jumbled sheets and a deep indentation on the mattress. Liza wasn't in the room. My father was lying on the floor, dead in front of the large mirror. His face and his body and his arms and mouth were covered with thick disinfectant, the, the kind you would use to clean a bathroom or, or a kitchen floor. There was a harsh, sterile smell around him. I found them after I got back from a run on the beach. She was lying there with his dead body. Liza found us. When she got home, she, she found us lying next to each other. She screamed. She screamed like a little baby girl, a terrified baby girl, maybe maybe thinking we were both dead. And then she got to be... She got to be so pitied. She got to be all of their daughters. I never believed it was a suicide, like they said. Daddy, I found your body discarded in front of that mirror. I laid down on the floor next to you... I arranged your arms so you hugged me with your hands. It was was a kind of a happy moment, in the way that moments can sometimes be happy if you accept them. Moments full and complete, separated from anything else, anything called reality. I can still see you out there. When I stood on your stage and danced and acted and all I could see was the dark, All I could see was the lights on my face and the dark. An endless dark which ate me, which consumed me. There's a man waiting for me now. 
or I have a date. His name is Johnny and I hear he's an aspiring actor. I see him now. He's wearing a sports jacket and a shirt open at the collar. Shiny black shoes and freshly pressed pants. He looks nice. He's only a few years older than me. He has a smooth face and short hair which is curled. I see him and I see so much of myself in the world. I see him and I see a future. I can see you now. You gave me that gift. It made me electric, like I was praying, like I was talking to God. I love you. 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 That was The Artist's Electric by Judas Goff, directed by Anisha Srinivasan. The role of Brittany was played by Hannah Lawrence, and the role of Liza by Caitlin Ennis Edwards. Yeah, I like monologues. I, ex exactly for the same reason that I like storytelling things, because you can do weird things with music under it. One of my all-time favorite things on the radio ever is a series of monologues that Chris Morris comedian, recorded um, around 22 years ago. Have a listen to it. It's on YouTube. Yeah. It's called Blue Jam Monologue. But, but do that after you listen to the podcast. Yes. Which you have now. Yeah. And all of the episodes. Yes. And liked, and liked us on Facebook and Twitter and shared us. Yes. And reviewed us on iTunes or on Spotify. Yep. Or told your favourite people about it <laughs> if He's that's a thing so eloquent we're both writers isn't that great yeah <laughs> we both have writing degrees so i don't eloquent. have a speaking degree this is this is it's true um that's all for us this month yep we will be back next month with a few more plays yeah some new pieces yeah hopefully and new uh, new cast of actors and new directors yep and all that stuff. Yep. So stay tuned. Thank you for listening. And we will see you in a month's time. Thanks for listening. Have a good one. Goodbye. Okay.